Thank you for joining the Resilient Cyber Show. My name is Chris Hughes, and today we're joined by Jim Dempsey and Jimmy Sharma. Thanks for joining me, y'all. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So, you know, I've interviewed both of you separately, as I talked about a moment ago, but for folks that don't know you, haven't caught those episodes, don't follow you online, and you haven't read some of your content and so on, can you each tell us a bit about your background? Jenny? Sure. Um, Now, my name is Chenny Sharma. I uh, am kind of formerly in the tech space, uh, was an iOS developer for a while, Uh, came to law school because I was um, disenchanted with uh, the startup world because of a lot of the reasons that we'll talk about today uh, and irresponsible practices. And uh, since going to law school, I focused a lot on tech, law, internet governance issues generally with a focus on cybersecurity. And I'm here at Fordham Law School. I'm an associate professor. How about you, Jim? Yeah, um, as I always say to folks, I'm a lawyer. I have uh, practically zero tech background, although in, I guess, 40 years, I've tried to educate myself and uh, pick up a lot. Currently, I teach a course on cybersecurity law at Berkeley uh, Law School. Just yesterday, I'm pleased to say, I sent off the uh, updates for the second edition of Cybersecurity Law Fundamentals, uh, published in 2020. Yeah, exactly. Published in 2021, and so much has happened in the past three years. It is phenomenal. So that should be out in the spring. And uh, I also have uh, an appointment at Stanford uh, University where I do research and writing on cybersecurity issues, cybersecurity awesome. policy and policy and legal issues. Yeah, yeah, you have, you both have quite the background. As I mentioned, I've interviewed you both separately on different topics. You know, uh, Jim Ayi and I chatted quite a bit about open source software and, and things like that and security. And Jim, we've talked a lot about cyber regulation and things of that nature. Uh, so you're two of the sharpest people I know in the industry on these topics. So I wanted to pull you together today to talk about uh, software liability, you know. So to set the table a little bit, uh, we've been hearing a lot about software liability, you know, as recently uh, as a couple of weeks ago, Jenny Shirley talked about it, you know, on a panel about China. I was talking about suppliers and vendors and things like that. And we've seen it mentioned in the national cyber strategy. I'm um, curious from both of you, uh, maybe, you know, Jimmy Sharp start us off first. You know, why are we hearing such an emphasis on software liability and, and what does it even mean? What is it? Yeah. Um, so software liability is something that I think uh, academics have talked about and written about for um, decades now at this point and industry has talked about uh, both in terms of uh, not wanting it because it'll have a negative impact on their ability to innovate and be, um, you know, rapidly respond to things in the environment. Um, But also there are definitely a non-negligible number of people in industry that are like, there's not a lot of responsible security practices and something should change. But the reason I think we're talking about it a lot now is we've had kind of a trend of relatively devastating cyber attacks in the past several years, both in open source components and in proprietary software from kind of SolarWinds to Log4Shell. Um, And that kind of culminated in the Biden administration's national cyber plan, which I think we're coming up on a year since that came out last March. Um, And in what I think is like, um, and I'm curious Jim's thoughts, because he has uh, like such a prolific background in government, um, but I I was really kind of impressed uh, and thought it was quite, uh, for lack of a better term, brave of the administration to come out and say expressly that they were uh, calling for liability on software vendors for insecure software um, for unduly or unreasonably insecure software. So recognizing that all software is going to have vulnerabilities to some degree, um, but there are some really, um, really egregious practices out there and it's leading to vulnerable software in our critical infrastructure and ultimately the public is suffering the harm of that when things like colonial pipeline happen and um, critical services are shut down or important information is compromised. Um, And since then, um, kind of Jim and I and several other people in various disciplines have been thinking about, well, what would liability actually look like? And I think at the most, uh, the simplest terms, it's what is going to make for a viable lawsuit or regulatory action against a company when something that they did or did not do resulted in insecure software that got exploited and caused actual harm to users or businesses or the government? Yeah, uh, Chinny's right on on track, uh, Chris. And, and by the way, Chris, 
you mentioned Jen Easterly's testimony of a couple of weeks ago. All of your listeners, uh, if you haven't uh, listened to Jen Easterly's testimony, do so. Uh, listen to the, uh, the, the, the live uh, you know, YouTube uh, version. Her written statement is pretty plain vanilla, but wow, she knocked it out of the park on her oral testimony. Just a tour de force, five minutes, uh, and a complete encapsulation of where we stand now, now with respect to cybersecurity. And there's the link. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, but, um, you know, Ginny's right. Uh, that Biden cybersecurity strategy, March 2023, uh, just about a year ago, was groundbreaking in several respects. 80% of what was in that strategy had been in the Trump strategy. And most of what was in the Trump strategy had been in the Obama strategy. And most of what was in the Obama strategy had been in, probably in the Bush strategy. But on two things, the administration said, uh, this ain't working. And one was on critical infrastructure in their commitment post-colonial pipeline, which was clearly a watershed. And finally, people said enough is enough. This public-private partnership concept of letting these critical infrastructure operators to handle this on their own uh, just isn't working. And secondly, on software liability, the administration again said, look, we've, it's not working. We've got a market failure here. You know, Patch Tuesday, I was just looking at it, is now 21 years old. For the past 21 years, every single second Tuesday of every single month, Microsoft issues dozens, some months, a hundred or more patches to all of this software, which we are all dependent upon in absolutely everything we do. Personal, governmental, democracy, national security, critical infrastructure, banking, private industry, everybody is dependent on these Microsoft products and every single month they issue uh, this, these patches. Uh, a couple of days ago, 73 patches, five of them critical, two of them being actively exploited. And by the way, um, Patch Tuesday is almost always followed by Exploit Wednesday, um, which is that of the 73, two were being exploited. You can be sure that the minute those patches came out, the bad guys, both criminals and nation state actors, began looking for the other but both for those where people hadn't installed their patches, as well as trying to figure out what they could do with the others. Um, so you know, there are two schools, Chris, and we can get into this more. Two schools. One, eh, we're doing okay. This is the price of having innovative software. This is the price of uh, the digital age. Um, it's good enough and we can't do any better. That's one school, which opposes liability. They say that software of all of the sectors in the country, automobile makers are liable, toaster makers are liable, the operators of critical infrastructure are liable, the, the custodians of our data are, are liable, but software says we shouldn't be liable. That's one school. Let us just innovate and we will push stuff out knowing that it's faulty and every Tuesday, every second Tuesday of the month or on other cycles, because the other guys do, you know, the other big, big software developers do the same thing. There's another school of thought which says we got to we got to change the incentives here. We've got to bring software into the normal world of responsibility. Which is you should be responsible for the consequences of your carelessness. And that's the that's the debate now, Chris. That's the debate. Yeah, and, and, and you mentioned it's there seems to be two extremes on this side of the conversation. Uh, one of those extremes, you know, <clears throat> talks about how it's not practical, it can't be done. Others, you know, uh, like you and some others who have put together some, you know, practical examples or recommendations of what it may look like. And and you had a paper recently, which I want to touch on. In that paper, you talk about, you know, some other industries, for example, I think it was that, you know, examples could be pulled from of what software liability might look like. You know, can you give some examples of what that may be? Well, let's take the automobile. 
you know, um, over a hundred years ago, uh, when the automobile industry was in its infancy, the makers of automobiles tried to disavow uh, liability if they made a faulty product, if they made a defective uh, product. And in a groundbreaking case, when was the year, Chinny, of McPherson versus Buick Motors? It was early, guess- in, the t- early in the 20th century. Yep. Um, a brilliant uh, judge uh, then on the New York State. 1916. Highest. 1916. I luckily just went over it with my torts class. So. 19, yeah, this is a classic case. Justice Cardozo said, no, no, you guys, you cannot avoid responsibility. Buick said, well, we didn't make the, the wheel. The, the, the wheel on the car fell apart. Uh, someone was hurt. Buick said, well, A, we didn't sell you the car, driver. You bought it from a dealer. Um, and B, um, anyhow, we didn't make the wheel. Someone else made the wheel. And Justice Cardozo said, look, the automobile is becoming critical to our society already. He could see it coming. And you cannot avoid liability. You are responsible for the product. And by the way, the, he, he said, it's in fascinating language that's just so relevant today. You, the automobile maker, you assemble all of these components, think open source, think libraries, think uh, the way that people pull together various components nowadays in assembling software. Judge Cardozo said, you pull in all these things, but you, the final maker, the final assembler of the automobile, or in my view of the software, you should vet this stuff to a reasonable level. We don't expect you, no one would ever produce automobiles if you had to look at every wheel and every component to the nth degree. He said, no, but you must use some due diligence and you must take responsibility and you must produce a product that is not unreasonably dangerous. And later on, years later, we layered on top of that some federal motor vehicle safety standards, which are issued. And we also had court cases saying the automobile makers tried to get around all that by putting something in the terms of service or the sale contract saying we're not liable. And finally, in the 50s and 60s, the court started rejecting that as well. And I think now software should take on that sort of maturity stance. Okay, we've had, how do you count, 40, 50, half a century of software development. You've learned a lot. You're a more mature industry. You no longer should be uh, shielded from the consequences. You should no longer be able to push these costs onto the businesses. And by the way, this is primarily not an issue that I look at as a consumer issue. It's the businesses that are bearing the cost. Uh, Businesses who are the users of this software that are bearing the costs of this faulty product that they use and that we're all dependent on. Yeah, just to kind of build on a couple of things Jim said, um, McPherson was also a huge case because it kind of talked about the fact that you know it got rid of privity, which in lawyer language is just there were two parties that made a contract with each other, so they have a direct relationship. And you know what Buick said was like, well, maybe I'm liable to the dealer. We had a contract, but I'm definitely not liable to the person who bought the car because like I don't know them from Adam. Like they're just totally unrelated to me. And the court said, you know that when you make a car, more than just the dealer is going to be impacted by how it's made. And so it all turned on like foreseeability. And so because the supply chain for software is so complicated and the fact of the matter is like a lot of the irresponsible players are part of like the upper end, the left side of the software life cycle. And none of them have the same incentive to be especially secure. It's only when you get to the business consumer of the software that they are now both not in a position to inspect the software to see whether it's vulnerable, just like a person can't look at a car. I can't look at a car and know whether the brakes are working. Um, But they also are not in direct contract with any of the people further upstream that were making the software. And so there's like the same kind of real issue here of just because uh, 
I software entity does not have a direct relationship with the person who's ultimately at the end of the chain licensing the software doesn't mean I'm not responsible to them. And like foreseeability is like a really great concept because what that means is, you know, in the case of McPherson, the person was driving on a gravel road and ended up hitting a pole. And so as a car manufacturer, you have to know that your wheels are not just going to be on pavement. They're also going to go on gravel. Um, and, you know, there's in software security, there's also a conversation around, well, but there are bad actors here. Like software is insecure because um, bad actors come in and do things. But even with cars, like we force, we, we want cars to be, um, we know that some kind of traffic or accidents are going to be inevitable and we need cars to be able to like withstand that. They can't just combust at like a minor, like fender bender kind of situation. Um, just to call out like a really great paper, um, one of our colleagues, Brian Choi, wrote a paper called Crashworthy Code. Um, and I think it's really excellent. and talks about you should be writing code and putting it through the kind of crash testing that cars go through. So, yeah, I wanted to jump in real quick, if I could. <clears throat> the, the open source piece in particular is something that we talked about in previous discussions. But, you know, people often bemoan the government and, and the government's ability to get things right. Uh, but for anyone who's been following along, you know, uh, the OMB memos around secure self-attestation of software from suppliers to the government, for example, in that self-attestation form, uh, the government actually puts the supplier in a position where they have to take responsibility for any open source software components they include in their product. Uh, you know, kind of pointing out the fact that they chose to include these components, not the software developer, the open source software maintainer, contributor, et cetera. The vendor took the decision to, you know, take these and put them in their products are now responsible for them. And then go ahead, Jim, I'm sorry. Well, and that, by the way, that OMB memo and the, the government's effort there is, is a very important piece of the puzzle here. Uh, now, what's unique about the, the federal government, as well as many state governments, is they have something called the False Claims Act, um, which says that we as a purchaser, we the government, um, we can require you to at attest self-certify as to what uh, your product does or doesn't do. We, the purchaser, set standards and we, the government, particularly the federal government, have huge purchasing power and huge power in these contracts. So the government is now going to be, the U.S. government is now going to be insisting, as you say, that the companies who supply software to the government uh, attest that they are meeting certain standards, including uh, vetting the underlying software, uh, open source software components that go into the final product. If you lie, if you make a claim about your product that is false and you still bill the government, that submission of your invoice to the government where you say, you said in your bid solicitation and you said in your contract, we've done these things and that we're free of these flaws and you're not, that's a false claim, which under the False Claims Act carries civil penalties as well as potentially uh, criminal uh, consequences. That doesn't really apply to the private sector users. So the government has a power here. And by the way, that's an important driver, certainly trying to use that to then raise all boats, you know, to, to, to force every, everybody across these common products to, to raise all their standards for both governmental purchasers as well as for private sector purchasers. But the private sector does not have the False Claims Act at its disposal. And instead, purchasers, including major business purchasers of software, are stuck with these terms of service or these contract terms where Microsoft and the other big uh, software developers say, we are not liable for any damages, any harm, even if we knew or should have known that th th there was a flaw, even if the damages were foreseeable, as Chinny says, we're still not liable. And that's the problem that the administration courageously, as Chinny said, took on and that's the problem that Chinny and I and other uh, academics have been focused on for the past uh, 11 or so months. Okay, if we're going to have a liability scheme, if we're going to eliminate those uh, disclaimers of, war, of uh, liability, 
and disclaimers of any warranty, then what? What does the legal standard look like? And my conclusion was the traditional tort standard of reasonableness is not good enough for us today in this software area. It took the courts 100 years. And then finally, the Department of Transportation stepped in with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. It took decades of case-by-case -case litigation to figure out what was a reasonably safe automobile. And we don't have decades. I, I believe, and if you believe that we have a cybersecurity crisis, national security crisis, commercial crisis, personal privacy crisis, if you believe that cybersecurity is at a crisis, then we don't have decades to work through case by case what is reasonable. Yeah, I think you're, you're pointing out the fact is we don't have time, in my opinion, like software is now pervasive to everything in our society from consumer goods to critical infrastructure, weapon systems, national security, economic prosperity. It's it's every every aspect of our modern society. Uh, you actually in your paper, you wrote about because many people will say, like, well, where do we start? You know, what 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 is good? Right. How do we define good? And in your paper, you talk about you know kind of establishing the floors, what you talked about, Jim. Can you talk about? You know what that phrase means and what are some examples or recommendations that you thought about on that front well you know i was building there on a paper that uh, chinny wrote uh with one of her colleagues at fordham law school ben sapersky who's a longtime um, expert on uh, tort law and chinny just t take a few minutes because your paper set me down the path you 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 turned my mind around on on focus on the product and explain how you got there. Yeah, sure. And kind of to give credit to my colleague, Ben Zapersky, who is uh, like, you know, Titan in torts. Um, he actually kind of over many conversations cha took, changed my mind around to products liability over general negligence, which general negligence um, to summarize it is basically, I sue someone and the court is figuring out, okay, is the harm that I allegedly suffered something that came out of unreasonable behavior vis-a-vis -vis the specific contextual relationship that I have with the person I'm suing. Um, and like Jim said, the reason why that's uh, been really weak or is not a compelling way to address software security is it focuses on practices. And what it allows is it allows defendants to bring up your standard, like just got a CISSP kind of certificate, cybersecurity expert that says, you have um, complied with like steps one, two, and three of the New York D, uh, DFS standards. You have um, like, you know, a security expert on your team. You're doing things from a process standpoint. That is what we recommend in the industry as best practices. But I think as anyone knows, that's either, you know, been in, a software development life cycle or just talk to somebody it's a perfunctory compliance regime like you do it because you're checking the box on your compliance list but that doesn't mean you're doing it with the rigor that people intend to actually get the results and so what my colleague convinced me of and what now i think jim and i and ben strongly believe is that product liability is a better way to get at what we want which is we look at the product and we say I don't care about the process that got you here. I'm going to first start with an analysis of, is this a defective piece of software? And a defective piece of software can be defined in terms of like legalese in a lot of different ways. But essentially, it's if when I purchase something, I expect it to work for what I'm purchasing it for, like what they're advertising it to me for. Um, and that includes, I expect it to work under like normal conditions. So if I, you know, have a laptop, I want it to work even if it's 100 degrees outside because it's going to regularly be 100 degrees outside in many places in the world. And so like that's not really uh, what we think of as core to how a laptop works, but that's still an important part of the system to give your consumer something that actually works the way they need it to work. And the same way in software security, like attacks at this point are just a 
inevitability for most systems. And so you need to build something that is resilient to that. Um, and if it is not, then it should be considered defective. And then once we say like, okay, this is defective, this is unreasonably dangerous as a product because it is vulnerable to these attacks, then we say, okay, was there a better way to build it? Like, could we have done better here? Or is this like a, there was no way anyone could have um, prevented this from happening without taking on like exorbitant costs to the point that we wouldn't even be able to provide this product to the public. That was a bit of a long description. Yeah, well, the, but that, and that's what got me going here, Chris. Um, focus on the product. Focus on the outcome. And by the way, everybody says they want performance-based, outcomes-based uh, regulation and liability. If the product has certain defects in it, unreasonable flaws in it, it doesn't matter how it got there. It doesn't matter whose fault it was. You don't have to go back over the whole Slack channel chain and the whole email chain and the whole development chain and who said what and who put it in there and what considerations were made and all that kind of stuff that lawyers spend millions of dollars in some cases. None of that should matter. None of that process should matter if there was a flaw. <laughs> It's a flaw. So what products liability law does is focus on the product, not on the process. And that got me thinking, okay, what about the product? Well, as Chinny said right at the outset, 30 minutes ago, there's no perfect software. So it can't be that you're liable for every flaw. It can't be that uh, plaintiff's lawyers can go roving over software with their experts and find flaws and then start bringing lawsuits. So we've got to figure out a way to prioritize the flaws. And I started looking at the um, CVE list, Common Vulnerabilities uh, and Exposures uh, list assembled by um, uh, it's uh, uh, NIST and MITRE, yeah. By NIST mm -hmm. and MITRE, and, and, and MITRE functioning under government contract. CVEs are specific flaws in specific products. And there are now tens of thousands of them. <laughs> Most, and, and then diving deeper, what I learned based upon work done at CISA, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the Department of Homeland Security, 80 to 90% of CVEs are never exploited. So what CISA has done and what it has pushed is the notion of, first of all, what are the underlying weaknesses? Many of these vulnerabilities, it turns out, um, display or are based on underlying common weaknesses for overflow, path traversal, um, flaws that it turns out developers are making over and over again. And if you actually go one level of generality up from the vulnerability to the weakness, there are certain weaknesses that account for a disproportionately large number of the exploits in the wild. And what CISA has started to do, working with um, MITRE and working with NIST is what CISA has started to do is to compile annually a list of the worst exploits and link those most consequential exploits, real world, this is real data out there in the wild, what the bad guys are taking advantage of, and linking it back to the underlying weaknesses. And these weaknesses are well known. They're well understood. Bad guys know how they work. The good guys know how to fix them and they should know how to avoid them. And I said, well, let's look at, there's the top 25. And by the way, on the top 25 list that you've put in the link, Chris, many of those are on the list year after year. 
So the developers are making the same kinds of mistakes time and again, and the bad guys are exploiting these same mistakes time and again. And we know that. And I said, so let's make a floor. Instead of being liable and trying to make people liable for every flaw, let's start with this top 25 list and the weaknesses that are, they represent, which are, again, real world, the bad guys. These, this is what the bad guys are going after. And make that the floor and say, look, software developer, we don't expect you to eliminate every flaw. That's impossible. We would, no one would ever get any software or it would be unusable. Don't try to eliminate every flaw. Focus on these top 25 or maybe some subset of the top 25. And honestly, again, I said at the outset, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a technologist. Um, I'm not sure if all of these top 25 are the right 25, if all of them are actually uh, able to be captured or not. But there must be some floor of no-nos, some definitive floor where, again, basically you keep the discovery process, the lawyer process, the expensive litigation process. You don't need all that. You say, did your product have this flaw? Yes. You, knew, you We've known this category of flaw for years now, in some cases, decades. The bad guys exploited it. Real harm was uh, imposed on users. You, the software developer, should be liable. And that was my theory of the floor. Focus on the product, focus on the features. Don't get hung up on the process for the floor of liability, the certain minimum that no mass market software should fall below. Yeah, it makes sense. And for folks following along, I posted a link for the common weaknesses and enumerations, which Jim is talking about there. It shows a top 25 list. And as he said, year over year, uh, you tend to have the same culprits popping up uh, year over year. Uh, Jim, Manny, I want to ask you, you had a paper titled the, A Bug in the Software Liability Debate, where you talk about some of the challenges defining a duty of care and dealing with unknown vulnerabilities. Can you expand on that piece of it? Yeah, absolutely. So in that context, I was kind of thinking more broadly about, you know, Jim and I have talked about, it's not every bug. It's the ones that we think you could and should have done better for the customers to fix. Um, but what does that mean? How do we evaluate? And uh, Jim's paper addresses this too, of like, what's secure enough? Like, what does secure mean? Um, because, you know, what any developer will tell you, just because a patch came out doesn't mean that we should have to deploy that patch because it might not be a critical component in our software. Deploying the patch might make other um, components in our software more vulnerable because of incompatibility reasons. There's like various reasons. You might say like, oh, we don't like memory safe programming languages. But for example, in robotics, uh, memory unsafe programming languages like C are just necessary because for efficiency purposes in terms of speaking more closely to the hardware. Um, and so if there's all these domain specific kind of carve outs to, you know, we have these general ideas of what secure software is, but it doesn't, you can't universally apply it. Then, then what do we do? How do we figure out objectively when software is insecure to the point where you want it to hold a company accountable? And in that paper, me and my um, co-author, John Speed Myers, who is another great thinker on in this space, um, really smart from, from ChainGuard, um, we're talking about how the risk here is the lack of objective empirical research on what actually makes secure software. Um, and Jim is right to call out, like we have the CVEs, we have the CWEs, and that goes a step towards figuring out what is causing some software to be more exploitable than other software. But it's, it's an incomplete list and there's so much more information that we need to come up with a truly comprehensive standard of care of like what companies, what we, how we, what we want to hold companies to. And the problem is when there's a lack of objective empirical information, what that means is industry can come in and because there's a lot of resources in industry, and we're seeing this kind of play out in the AI context in terms of how companies and their relationships with government and the funding that goes into that is influencing policy there can kind of introduce a self-serving version of what their own limitations are, what we should consider reasonably safe to mean. 
And that's not going to be in the public interest. And so the question is, like, how do we get at truly objective information in this space? And, you know, one thing that I think, you know, Jim and I have probably heard from a lot of people, including other academics that are thinking about liability is it's just impossible. We can't come up with a list. Software is too much like everything's a snowflake and like it, you nothing is the same. There's no common principles. And like I think Jim has refuted that and that like there are common issues that we can all just say this is there is no reason for you to have this like, you know, default passwords, I think, is one uh, specific weakness that Jim calls out. But there are so many other fields where there's always context specific issues, but that doesn't mean those fields don't have standards. Like if you take building codes, building codes in an urban environment, in a temperate climate and building codes in an environment that regularly gets above 120 degrees are going to be different. And they figure that over time and it's evolved and there's science behind it. And a lot of these standards started in industry before the government formally adopted them. Accounting is another place where the generally accepted accounting principles are evolved over time, but all accountants now have to comply with them. And so like, this is an area where it is, it behooves industry. And, and I'm not talking the people you see testifying before Congress from the private sector. I'm talking your line engineer to, and the security researchers to come together and say, our corporate interests aside, what are what does the research tell us we should be doing here? Like it shouldn't be a matter of competitive advantage. This is a matter of public safety. And that kind of information sharing is going to be necessary to get at the standards that we should require companies to comply with. And if they don't, we hold them liable for. I think that the industry involvement piece real quick, Jim, is uh, super yeah. critical. And the reason I say that is like many people who are bemoaning this or saying it's not possible or practical, et cetera, uh, if they don't engage the government, it's kind of clear that things are heading in a certain direction. If you don't engage the government, you're going to be left with what you get left with. So you need to you need to be involved, engaged, and vocal, I think, if you want to try to shape how this may look, because your your technical expertise, your commercial industry expertise is absolutely needed in this conversation, too. Well, and I, I, Chris, I wanted to uh, say many of the, the same things on that point and give a shout out to uh, Carl Landwehr, who um, probably now 10 or 15 or even more years ago, wrote an article called Building Codes for Building Code, um, drawing on this physical world building code concept. And he specifically called in that paper, a series of papers, for the software engineering coder community to take the lead. And he didn't get pickup on that. And now I think it is time, as Cheney said, and as you said, Chris, to resurrect that idea. Absolutely. You know, we need... Again, this is a mature industry now. You know, I was perfectly happy and I was a proponent of the don't quash innovation with regulation. I was 100% a proponent of that. In many respects, I still am. But we've now got a mature field and we've got a mature profession. And the profession of software engineering should take on this question. Be better them than me. I'm not the guy who should be developing the, the, the code here and the, the, the building code. Yes, absolutely. This should be something that comes up from the uh, profession itself. And then you have at the, this, this, then you have a true standard. Again, I want to focus on specific product defects for the floor. But Chinny said, that's not everything. We, new things will come down the road. How do we identify them, prevent them, mitigate them, avoid them in a reasonable way? That's where the software development standard comes into play. And that's where it has to be, in many ways, industry led. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that you both agree because, uh, you know, from my perspective, I've been involved in some industries like defense and federal government, civilian agencies and so on, where compliance and policies have been written by folks. You can tell 
you know, maybe they weren't practitioners or they weren't close to the work that they're governing with the policy. And it can make it very uh, difficult to comply or it can have an unintended consequence. So I think it is critical that the development community is involved here. They know what it looks like best, better than anyone else. Uh, so they need to be vocal and involved here to help shape, you know, what that floor would look like. And I want to ask you both, I know we're you know coming up towards the end of the interview here. Another critical part of the conversation around software liability is inversely, obviously, safe harbor, which has gotten some good, you know, uh, commentary as well as well as in the, you know, the executive order we talked about, our national cyber strategy. I'm sorry, as well as also being mentioned by Jenny Easterly in, in that conversation that we cited earlier. Uh, can you each, you know, give a little bit of a perspective on, you know, what safe harbor is and what that may look like and why that's a critical kind of counterbalance to this piece of loss liability as well. So this is what we're talking about, which is that the overarching secure software development standard framework, that's where I would focus on process. And that should be the safe harbor for everything above the floor. So for the floor, if you fall below the floor, if you do one of these no-nos, you should be per se liable for any consequential damages, um, direct or indirect damages. Above the floor, again, we would look at, is there a design defect? Was there a reasonable alternative? Is the product uh, dangerous with that flaw in it? But if you had some adherence to this safe harbor, or not some adherence, solid adherence to this secure software development set of practices, then I think you should be immune. This is under the theory that, yes, you had a flaw, but it was just too hard to um, discover. It, it would have been unreasonable to expect you to do the work that was necessary to find this flaw and avoid it. And that's where you get into this question. There you are talking about practices, uh, processes. Chinny, do you agree? I mean, am I on track with that? No, I think that's the right characterization of safe harbor. Um, and I guess to maybe like stir the pot a bit, yeah. I, like in all candor, I am extremely skeptical of the way safe harbors are being talked about. And this is kind of removing myself from what I think will be politically viable and what is the compromise that we're ultimately going to need to land on. And just coming from like, your classic magic wand scenario of what I think would actually be good to really get secure software. Um, because like at this point, if we're, if we already put liability on the table, like let's get imaginative, like let's, let's see what we really want. Like, obviously it's going to get chipped away down the process, but like, let's start from a good place. But I think, I, I think Jim and I are on the same page of, I don't want to hold a company accountable for a bug that there was no amount of reasonable practices that could have prevented it. But I think that a products liability framework already accounts for that. And then putting a safe harbor on top of that just gives you two cuts at getting immunity for something. Because in a products liability framework, and like not to get into the legalese of it, but if you show either that um, there was no other way to build this that would have been like reasonable without this defect, then you're not liable for it. Even if we find that the product is defective in that there is something that caused harm. Or if you show like the utility, like the benefit of this for society and us getting this out there at the cost that we're getting it out there is so important that the forcing us to fix this bug is not worth it because then you'll lose overall society, like a, an overall value to society. Like, so for example, if we say memory unsafe programming language is bad and everyone's on the hook for um, any software built with that, well, all of a sudden you're just gonna have a massive amount of the software ecosystem that's just gonna get pulled off the shelves. And we might say like, that's not good because the public needs that, critical infrastructure needs that. And so I think that that's like on its own pretty good at kind of, protecting responsible defendants. Um, and my concern about a safe harbor on top of that is if it is in fact process-based, I think that's just another opportunity for industry to kind of do like a perfunctory check the boxes list of things and not really need to show that there was no actual way to do better. Because like part of what we want here is like what security researchers do, which is how do we actually get ahead of the next generation of attack vectors? Like 
NIST framework be damned, like that's backwards looking. We know that those are good things, but like what's the next layer of things that we should be doing to get ahead of things? And I just feel like if if unless a safe harbor is designed in like a like a pretty humble way, it could end up like allowing people to kind of just stick with archaic best practices and not move the needle. Um, and there are ways, I think, to do that. You can have a safe harbor that's maybe like burden shifting or like a presumption of, well, now the defendant has shown that they were presumptively reasonable. And now it's back on the plaintiff to show, no, I'm bringing my expert to say, like, look at all these papers that are out there of security researchers that show you could have done this pretty low cost thing to prevent this. And actually, you have security researchers who wrote some of these papers. So you knew you could have done that, you know? So like maybe just not have it be an end all be all immunity thing. But I like totally agree with Jim on principle. Yeah. And you know, uh, Chris, two points. One is um, Chinny, Chinny's right that I was taking as a given and as a starting point, the administration's national cyber strategy. And they said two things, there needs to be a standard of care and there needs to be a safe harbor. So I just took that as a given. I just said, okay, now let me put on my thinking cap and figure out how would that work. Second point that Chinny made, which I think is critical, both she and I agree, and I think you agree too, Chris, cost-benefit analysis is at the core of all of this. We're going to want to be looking at what's the benefit of the product versus what was the cost of making it um, more secure versus what is the likelihood of harm and you balance those things. And that's what we have done in every other sector of the economy. This is my point going back to 1916 and uh, McPherson versus Buick Motors. That's what we've done in every other sector. We do have cost benefit analysis, looking at the value of the product, the risk of harm, the likelihood of harm, and the cost of the corrective measure, the cost of catching the flaw or defect before the product goes out on the market. And that's what we're all we're saying, and, and this Chinny and I are 100% in agreement, 100% in agreement. That's what we need for software. Yeah, I think that it's critical for the emphasis that you both made there on the cost benefit analysis and the trade-offs, because some people hear this conversation and they think it's just gonna be a heavy handed, uh, one directional situation where that's not the case, you know, cybersecurity is ultimately the business of risk management. You'll never eliminate all the risk. You'll have to always accept some level of risk. And that's what we're talking about doing at a broader systemic societal level with this conversation. Uh, so that said, you know, I know we can keep going for quite a bit, but we're coming up on time. Uh, so Jim uh, and Chinny, thank you both so much for joining me. If you don't follow these folks on LinkedIn, I definitely recommend checking them out and giving them a follow as well as, you know, they, they often publish on sites like Lawfare, Lawfare Blog and others. Uh, so give them, a, give them a follow on there if you want to follow the conversation on software liability, open source software security, you know, uh, safe harbor and so on. Uh, and thank you so much for both uh, for joining us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks so much. Chinny, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. It was always great talking with both of you.